Hi guys, Jake Wilson here. Thanks for checking out this video. Today, we're going to be talking about using voice leading in our changes playing and exploring quite a few uh, ways that I approach this particular subject um, using one particular case study. So in this video, we are going to get a little bit more theoretical than uh, my previous videos. Um, but don't worry, I'm going to try to really lay it down for you. And if you have any questions, just leave a comment and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I possibly can. And to be honest, actually, some of this stuff seems more complicated than it actually is. Um, there might just be a bit of a sort of a click moment. And if you really go through the video and hopefully pay attention to uh, each step, you won't get lost along the way. I would really recommend people avoid skipping forward too much because each piece of information is contingent on the last piece of information, if that makes any sense. Hope it does. And I don't want you to be put off by how complex this seems at first glance because it's my experience and I know the experience of many others that actually this stuff becomes second nature the more you um, get into the habit of analyzing things like this. And of course, the more we do this, the more we're going to be able to hear our way into these things. Um, so don't worry, you're not gonna have to get your pencil and paper out every time you sit down to play through any changes. And for those of you who aren't super, super into improvising this kind of stuff, well, I'd really recommend you uh, stick around because some of this stuff is really valuable for composition, arranging, and all that kind of thing. It's really valuable information. I think it's tragically undertaught. So I need to put out a quick disclaimer before we get going. And as you might expect, the real world, real life playing is always more nuanced than these neat and tidy um, explanations for things. Um, there are plenty of exceptions to the rules and there are kind of all different contexts where some of these ideas might fall down. So what I'm really trying to do is to give you a practical guide to how I approach this subject. So if I'm writing a melody if, or if I'm playing through some complex changes and things just aren't really cooking, I might fall back on some of these techniques and nine times out of 10, they, they work really well. And what would be amazing is if you leave this video um, with new things to consider, new things to work on, and perhaps to go into these situations just a little bit more thoughtfully. If, you, if you're sort of starting out, this might be the ideal video for you when it comes to playing through changes. And while much of the nuts and bolts of this lesson apply directly to the case study, the principles are generally sound. So you can apply the same kind of uh, technique, if you like, to other uh, situations. Sometimes to make these things absolutely crystal clear, you need to show people when things don't work and go into why. And hopefully it's really clear to you um, when watching the video when I'm doing that and when I'm not. I'd hate for people to think I was deliberately playing some absolute guff. So I think I'll find some visual way of uh, letting you know just in case people skip ahead in the video and go, why is he playing that? Uh, yeah. So let's get into our case study. Today we're going to be looking at playing over two major seven chords. So it's a sequence of two chords. It's an E major seven and a C major seven. So there's no common mode that contains both uh, of the pitches from the E major 7 tonality and the C major 7 tonality. Um, so what we need to do is we need to change our harmonic field when we transition from one chord to the next. So many of you will already know that over major 7th chords we either play the major scale or more commonly in this kind of context, the Lydian scale. Now, these are the associated modes we're going to use uh, with this sequence. So we're going to play um, E Lydian on the E major 7 and C Lydian on the C major 7. So if you're just playing continuous lines through a sequence, just being able to sort of move from one mode to the next is going to work really, really well. And for lots of the time, it sounds great. And yeah, sure, go for it. But we want to be able to smoothly work from one line to the next. We want to avoid this thing where we're playing through and then we've got to jump to somewhere. It doesn't sound very smooth and it sounds all disconnected. So we need to kind of develop some ways in which we can make this happen a little bit more smoothly. So what we need to do is to find out where the sinews between the E Lydian territory and C Lydian territory uh, exist. So what we need to do is we need to compare these two tonalities and see what opportunities we have for transitions. So in this example, we have the E Lydian scale on the top 
On the bottom, we have the C Lydian scale, but starting on E so that we can compare. And this is to see how the notes relate to one another in pitch space. If you see the letter R, that's just me pointing out where the roots are. So you'll notice that there are three numbers, uh, 0, 1, and 2. So what I'm doing here is I'm pointing out whether something is a shared pitch, so 0, uh, it means it doesn't have to move at all, whether it has to move by one step, so a, a semitone, or whether it has to move by a tone, so that's the number 2. So now we have a way of visualizing how the pitches in one mode are proximate to the pitches in another mode. So the first thing you might want to try, if you haven't already, is use this matrix, if that's the right word, and just try to connect lines using these close relationships. Maybe have a, this open uh, while you're playing over this progression. We also need to remember that all of this needs to happen in reverse when we go back uh, to the E. As I said, this approach works really well most of the time for general line playing. But if you're trying to do something a bit more melodic, um, we might have to look at other approaches to make sure we're using really strong pitches. In harmony, there's always a hierarchy. Uh, some pitches are more important than others. Um, some pitches are present elsewhere, such as in the bass line. Um, some pitches will be dissonant in certain contexts and so on and so on. But you've probably heard about chord tone playing and the idea of target pitches and avoid notes. So this is where the hierarchy starts to come in. So if we're playing E Lydian over the E major 7, um, what we're going to notice is that most of the pitches work really well, especially the ones that are present in the chord, but some of them work less well if you land on them and stay there. Now they're not wrong notes, they, are, they, are just, um, they just need to be treated with a little bit more care than some of the others. So uh, let's have a look. The third is fine, the fifth is fine, although it doesn't tell us very much about the harmony. The major seven is great. Uh, now the root, the root in this context is sometimes problematic because in the accompaniment, you're going to have the major seven and you're going to get a clash, a, a, what you call a minor nine clash or a, a minor second clash. And this is generally seen to be unpleasant or unstable, which brings the nine into play a little bit more. And again, these things are really registrally dependent. So if you're playing lower down, it might sound better or worse. It really depends. spoken about the fourth degree of the scale or the sixth um, or if you like the eleventh and the thirteenth respectively. In Lydian the fourth or the eleventh is raised so that when we get to this sound here now that's a beautiful sound but if we're changing harmony we have to remember that we want to land and convincingly get across the idea that we've understood the harmonic nature of where we've landed and avoid too much ambiguity. But there is a way to make this sound amazing um, and more on that later. The sixth sounds fine in isolation in this context, but as a kind of landing zone, it's less effective um, than some of the other pitches in the scale. So in isolation, it sounds great. It just sounds like it's part of the chord, but as part of a melody or a line, it won't want to sit still. It will want to go somewhere. Again, more on that later. As we've already mentioned, the prevailing wisdom is to target chord tones. So in this context, I'm going to suggest that we aim for the, either the 9, the 3rd, or the major 7. The 5th is good if, you know, if you're in that part of the neck and that's what you can get to, it's good. It just doesn't give us um, as much harmonic information as those other pitches do. 
The ninth is, of course, quite ambiguous, but it's also kind of a familiar and stable sound um, that works very well. It gives us another option. So in this example, we've stripped away the non-chord tones and we've shown how proximate each chord tone is to the chord tone of the other harmony. So if you look at this chart, remember that I said that the root is not necessarily the, uh, the best pitch option in this case. Um, we can find a few ways of getting through uh, this harmony really effectively. And we can use these connections as either improvisational tools or as ways in which we can structure melodies. So one route through this sequence that we have is to take the major seventh of the E and move that upper semitone to the major third of the C. Again, that could move down or it could go up to the F sharp for the E and lead us there. So we can start building lines through this sequence. So when you're playing line playing or um, or shredding, what you're actually giving people is a kind of uh, contour which you've attached harmony to. The notes become slightly less important at that point, but if we slow things down or if we're playing in a context where the chords are moving uh, quickly and we don't have a lot of time to get harmonic information across, then this stuff is absolutely invaluable. Similarly, if we want to be really sophisticated and minimalistic, we're going to have to know um, not just the function of the note over the chord we're playing, but how it interacts with the overall harmonic ecosystem of the context that we're playing in. You know, where it goes to, uh, where it might come from, all, all those kinds of things. Now, of course, in reality, when we're improvising, we're going to find ourselves all over the neck. Um, so any of these connections are going to be really helpful. And the more little kind of escape routes you have between the harmonies, uh, the better. And just using this kind of voice leading technique is going to help you build those uh, really effectively. And it's going to take a bit of the guesswork out. It just takes a little bit of time and analysis to get to grips with it. And by moving from good notes in one key to good notes in another key, you're going to really enhance the sense of harmonic color. If you stick to roots and fifths, um, it might sound a bit more gray. And again, if you're always leaning on the ambiguous notes that aren't really singing um, and not doing anything with them, more on that later, I guess I keep saying, um, then that's going to sound a little bit gray as well. So while the most harmonic information is going to come across when we use pitches that weren't in the previous tonality, Sometimes using a shared pitch, one that both harmonic fields has, um, will be useful as what you might call a pedal tone. So for our purposes, a pedal tone is when we stay on one note as the harmony shifts below us. Um, this applies to uh, lead guitarists. Obviously, if you're a bass player, a pedal tone will be um, staying on the same pitch as the harmony changes above you. Um, but for us, uh, lead guitar players, we are talking about the uh, the top unit. Um, so the pedal tones are pitches that are going to be shared between the two uh, harmonic fields. And if you look at the diagram below, what you'll notice is I've pointed out where these pedal tones exist in this case study. As I've already mentioned, the root is not an ideal choice for a pedal tone because it is quite dissonant against the major seven. Uh, but we do have some options, and one option we have, which would work quite well, is the note of B, which is the fifth of the E major seventh, and it's the seventh of the C major seventh. So what you could do is you could straightforwardly use it as a pedal tone and just hold a B over the chord change. <laughs> Or you could use it as almost an anchor and uh, come up with lines that work around it um, to create a, a kind of interesting, almost three-part texture. That's something I like to do 
uh, quite a bit. So you keep referencing the B, coming down, playing some other stuff, and then keep referencing the B. Um, that's a really nice effect that you could try going for. <laughs> Context, not so much this one, it can be really, really useful to work out where the most um, harmonically efficient moves are. Um, if you look at this diagram, I've pointed out where I believe them to be in this case. Now, one of them contains the fifth, um, so it is not so efficient or, or isn't as colourful. But one that I did enjoy, and this could be for a, an important melody, um, or, or something, was the D-sharp to D um, move. So the D-sharp in this case is the major 7 of the E, and the D is the 9 of the C. So that's a really nice move that you might want to lean on a little bit to bring out a lot of harmonic colour. I'm a great believer that you should never neglect non-chord tones because they can use to amazing effect um, via the use of delayed resolution or suspension. So in my mind, suspensions can work up or down. Um, you're moving from a position of instability and going to somewhere that's stable. You kind of have to know that you're doing this in advance because when you set them up, they sound amazing and they sound really tense for a moment, but drop into something that's really satisfying. And that sense of delayed resolution can be exceptionally powerful. So if you look at this diagram, I tried to point out where I believe the most um, effective suspensions, uh, points of delayed resolution exist. Now, because they're the same type of chord, this area is between um, the sharp 11, which can either go up to the fifth or down to the third, or it's the, uh, the sixth, which can go down to the fifth. Um, and, and these are really, really cool sounds if used well. Now, because E is our home key, if you like, there's also the chance that we can use um, a, a, a natural four. I think that works quite well as well as a suspension. Again, very much not a landing note, very much not a safe note, handle with care. And that's, of course, because it's a semitone above the major third, which exists in the, uh, in the chord that's playing underneath us. So these suspensions, just sort of in isolation, um, might sound really cool if we just land one on the C, for example. Uh, let's go from an E major chord. And we're going to go from there, and we're going to use the sharp 11 suspension down to the major third. We're going to try to connect that with a common tone, uh, which is the F sharp. We might try the opposite direction as well, but let's try it in a, a slightly different place. Um, here we go. it might have occurred to you already that because the E um, is the home key, uh, because of where it's placed metrically, um, that makes the C almost feel as though it's coming from a, uh, a another borrowed key of E. So there is definitely um, a E to E minor sound going on because of course E Aeolian is the derivative key 
So I know we've been talking really theoretically about how these pitches connect to one another, but you might notice that um, when you're actually playing, you might be in position, it might be easier for you to visualize those pitches. And in this context, this approach might work quite well because we're dealing with tonalities that don't have many avoid tones. In other contexts, it can get you into trouble because you might forget or confuse yourself with regard to what the pitches are doing over the chords. So one thing I like to do, sometimes in my composition, sometimes in arranging, um, sometimes in soloing even, if I'm that on the ball, uh, which is very rare. Uh, but one thing I like to do is to construct a kind of through line that's threaded through um, all of the, uh, the changes in the sequence. Now in this uh, situation, I came up with this one um, that I thought worked quite nicely. Notice my treatment of the roots here. Um, I tried to kind of use them in the latter part of, of the, the bar so that they don't clash too much and they sound like they're going somewhere else. Um, but this can be a really, really powerful um, and effective technique. So you might want to also play with voice leading within larger structures in your playing. Um, so for example, we might say, well, let's play um, the top part of the E major seven. Um, where do things need to move for our next uh, line? Well, somewhere like there would work quite well. So you could have a line. Um, Sometimes it'll be two pitches, sometimes it'll be three pitches, sometimes it'll be one pitch that has to move. It depends where you start and where you want to go, whether you want to go up or down and so on and so on. But that can be really effective as well. Uh, it kind of shows a lot of control over uh, the harmonic landscape that you're operating in. And if you're feeling really adventurous, you might want to try building lines around uh, kind of contrapuntal motion, um, where one note wants to go one direction and one note wants to go another direction. Um, now, in the context uh, of this case study, uh, we have the major seventh of the E, which wants to go up. Uh, let's try to find something that wants to go down. Well, we have the major third of the E, would like to go down to the B. So we could develop a line that used those two pitches um, and uh, had them move in opposite directions. This kind of two-part movement can be really difficult to compute in real time, so don't worry if you have trouble with this, I know I do, um, but it can be really, really effective if you're writing a melody or an inner voice or something like that. I just find this kind of thing absolutely beautiful. It's all over the place in 
Bach and classical music, so it must be worth uh, putting in our music, right? <laughs> I stand by this method because I think it's really useful to understand how each voice moves from one chord to the next. And the way this plays out in reality is complex and uh, will vary dependent on the, the actual tune that you're playing on. Um, there are tons and tons of things like metric placement, you know, what sounds like the home key, uh, what pitches you've already heard in the chord before that can have an impact, a sort of residual impact on what the better notes to come are, and they can uh, force some interesting decisions. Uh, but I guess it's up to you to experiment with all this stuff and to find your own way with it. So I think it's really important to note that I'm actually, when I'm playing, I'm not consciously thinking about this stuff in my head. But what I am doing is I am sometimes preparing using these kinds of techniques to locate little areas that I might want to exploit. But if I'm dealing with something that's a little bit more sophisticated harmonically, uh, perhaps longer progressions, I find that this can help me find um, interesting things to do within the harmony of the tunes. I'd also like to say that we haven't touched on the idea of chromaticism to connect notes. We also haven't really spoken about the way we can move motifs around or adapt motifs so that they fit the new harmony. That is all really, really effective and I do that a ton as well. And just to mention chromaticism again, that can be really handy for just getting your hand into the, the right place again. And uh, we can all do with a bit of tension in that space. Let's say there's chord here and there's chord two here. Well, in this space here is a kind of no man's land where you can, uh, you can do a lot of things. And again, by the time you get here, you can make a lot of stuff work that really on paper shouldn't. And same when you get back to chord one, the same thing applies. And um, really it's up to you about how inventive you can be. Uh, there are no right or wrong rules. These are just guidelines. I mean, there are ways in which you can make notes that shouldn't work, work really, really nicely. So thanks for watching guys. I hope you got a lot out of that. Now I know that sounds like a lot of information to digest, but don't worry, your ears gradually get used to it. And you gradually get into the habit of uh, visualizing um, harmony in that way. Um, it can take some time, but don't fret. The sooner you get going on this kind of stuff, the more you're going to be turning your brain into that harmonic machine that I like to talk about. And the way I like to visualize it is that we can use it to thread a kind of coherent, uh, line through the progression and really make some beautiful and harmonically powerful music. So thanks for watching guys and as always if you look in the description below what you'll find is a link to my JTC products and if you want to go into even more depth on this kind of thing um, you might want to check out my melodic phrasing masterclass. Uh, it's like this but it's written down everything's hopefully much more clear than uh, me rambling on. And, um, and and yeah, I think that that might be your kind of thing. If this is the kind of thing you want to be looking more into, then go for it. So if you enjoyed this video, please leave me a like, a comment, um, or if you're feeling extra generous, just subscribe to my channel so that you can see more stuff like this come out as and when I do it. So thanks again, guys, and take it easy.